Last year when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside. Like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,090%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,050%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to PowerGagePreview.com for a free look. Again, that's PowerGagePreview.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me here today. It's the 29th of March. It is a Tuesday. About to wrap up the first quarter. As a matter of fact, on Thursday's show, we're going to do a little bit of a quarterly wrap and a quarterly look ahead. I love doing that a few times a year. So that's a big show coming up on Thursday. However, on today's show, we're going to talk about the markets. Believe it or not, we're about 5% from an all-time high in the S&P 500. You wouldn't know it. It doesn't feel like it, but we are, and that's an important sign. I talked about the Bitcoin breakout last week, and it broke out. I think things are just starting right now for Bitcoin. The rest of the year is going to be a big year for them. I saw Elizabeth Warren today. I was on a plane flying in, talking to CNBC. I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. Some crazy taxes they're trying to propose. I got three stocks for you. Three stocks that I think will do good, We whether interest rates go up, inflation goes up, you name it. All that end, there's a recession signal that's flashing recession, what that means for your money. Coming up right now on Making Money. Again, I'm Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is March 29th, 2022. It's a Tuesday and we have the markets up right now looking pretty good. Uh, we're going to talk about Bitcoin, as I mentioned, which broke out. Uh, a recession signal. We'll talk about that. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, I wasn't going to talk about her, but this morning I was on a flight, a Southwest flight again, uh, coming into Baltimore here, uh, very early morning, and she was on my little live TV thing they have there in CNBC. And she made some insane comments I'd like to comment on. Uh, and then I'm going to share three stocks they came up with, three stocks you've probably never heard of, maybe heard of one of them. Uh, but these are companies I think that are going to do really well, uh, consumer-based, uh, and we'll discuss those uh, before we wrap up the show here as well. But I will say, you know, I, I, I try to share some insight into my personal life from time to time. And, you know, a lot of times just making fun of myself or just it's trying to be something that's funny. And I always complain about Southwest, but I keep flying it because it's only nonstop from West Palm Beach to Baltimore on the days I need to be here. So I keep flying it. It's ridiculous early. My alarm goes off at 4 a.m. Um, so I, I'm, I'm already irritated. And then I get, uh, there's always something with the flight. Well, today I'm sitting in the second row and all of a sudden I saw the flight attendant like freaking out, uh, looking in the bathroom. A woman passed out. She couldn't get her out because she was stuck between the toilet and the wall. So I helped her and we drug her out, ripped her out. I'm, she's probably sore from us ripping her out of, out of the bathroom. Later down, I thought she was dead. I was freaking out. Thank God she, still, she was breathing, and within 30 minutes, she was back in her seat. No one knows what happened, but she's healthy and fine. And then, of course, you know, you're all worked up over that, and then I get up an hour later, and somebody spills coffee all over my pants. So I, I got to tell you, like, I could write a story, just fly southwest every day of my life. I'd probably hate my life, but I could write the best stories because this is crazy. There used to be a reality show, I believe, on southwest. I think it was like they followed the southwest check-in things. And I got to tell you, I, I, I wouldn't want to be an employee and have to deal with these, these crazy people, especially that early in the morning. It's absolutely nuts. But anyway, um, let's talk about the markets here. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the S&P not, you know, 5 or 6% from an all-time high, which is absolutely crazy to me, but but we're right there. So let me pull up the chart of the S&P real quick here for you. We're up about uh, four tenths of a percent this morning. We open on the highs of the day. It's about 1040 or so uh, East Coast time right now. But we're, we're on a verge here, uh, intraday, we, we broke it to the highest level since uh, mid-January. So that's, <laughs> man, you, you wouldn't think it. And, and again, this, this area right here that I'm highlighting, this is when really the, you know, the, the war kind of started on the 24th. Uh, but there was, the tensions were getting higher and higher and it sold off and it probably got the worst. The news is probably the worst down here when, again, people freak out and sell down there when it's really the best time to be buying. And look what the market's done since then. I mean, I mean again, we're at really the best level that we've seen since middle of January. And that's, that's to me, it's, it just shows how you have to truly put aside the headlines, put aside what 
your gut tells you sometimes uh, about negativity and, and and what this war is going to mean, what inflation is going to mean, uh, what interest rates going higher is going to mean. Uh, you know, we have to keep in mind that that the market often prices in what's going to be happening in the future. Because if you're in the market like me every single day, you knew the Fed at this, this year was going to start raising interest rates. You knew it. You didn't know when or the extent of it uh, or the velocity of it. And we still don't know. It's, they've only done it once, 25 basis points. There's a debate if they knew 50 or 25 next meeting. But we knew it was coming. So you price in higher interest rates. Uh, inflation started ticking up. That's, that's a debate. People were like half and half on that. Um, so, so that's not, not as good. But when it comes to uh, conflicts and wars, I talked about this. History shows typically when a situation like that happens, uh, especially ones that we're not directly involved in, you know, where our, our troops on the ground, uh, the market tends to snap back in a couple of weeks, which it has. It did exactly that. I've been preaching this and it actually did it. So folks, you know, when, when I'm saying things, I, I, I'm not always right. I, I'm going to be wrong a lot. But the goal is to help you from making mistakes. And then along with that will increase the amount of money you have. And mistakes are panicking, uh, freaking out, and selling when in reality, majority of times you should be doing the opposite, buying. And in a minimum, nothing, sitting on your hands and waiting for stocks to come back. So that's where we stand right now with the market. Things looking pretty good, as I mentioned. Um, and then let's talk Bitcoin. Last week, I said if Bitcoin breaks above 45,000, which it did, and right now it's around 47,800. If it breaks above that level and holds, and it has so far, it broke out two days ago. If it holds above that level, it should make a run to about 52,000, 53,000, somewhere in that range. And I still think that's extremely attainable. And if we get up to 52,000 or so, that's that's a big deal. Because even though that that 50,000 numbers doesn't really mean much, psychologically, it, it means a lot. It's going to get a lot of headlines. You may get people on the sidelines coming back in. But if you looked at the numbers, the underlying numbers when it comes to Bitcoin uh, in particular, um, the, the, the on-chain numbers show that a lot of the long-term holders like myself, uh, didn't sell during the the pullback that we had in the beginning of the year. Didn't sell after we hit 69,000 and pulled back to mid 30s, basically a 50% pullback. Held on strong and actually started accumulating more. And you're seeing a lot of people like me that are, that are long-term holders and believe that there's at least one or two more big moves up higher that you're going to hold on and definitely not selling the dips of anything, buying the dips. You have new money coming in. And the more that there's people like me that just hold and don't sell, it lowers the potential supply of Bitcoin. And when the supply is lower, all you need is demand to tick up a little bit. And you know, simple economics tells us that prices should move higher. Uh, so that, that's where we're in Bitcoin. And I still, I, I think cryptos are great here. I think it, it's, it should be an asset class, in, in my opinion. It should be something that you, that you own. Percentage-wise, how much, that's up to you. But it's, it should be something you have some exposure to, uh, in my opinion. So I saw a pretty cool headline yesterday. Uh, it's from Goldman Sachs. They were saying that they're seeing people moving away from bonds and cash. And again, that makes sense. Because if you take a look at what bonds are doing, uh, bond funds, bond ETFs, uh, they're going <laughs> down. And here's a chart of a TLT, which I talk about from time to time. Uh, it's the iShares uh, 20 plus year treasury bond uh, ETF. So this is a basket of, of long bonds. And as interest rates go up, I talk about this all the time, but I want to always drill it in. There's an inverse relationship between interest rates and the price of a bond. So as interest rates increase, the value of the bond goes down. Now, I don't always explain this. I just maybe sometimes assume people know things. But the reason the value of the bond goes down is very simple. So if I issue you a bond and I said, listen, I'm going to give you a bond uh, for 30 years. You're going to give me $10,000. I'm going to pay you 3% a year for 30 years. Then you get your $10,000 back. If suddenly interest rates, and I'm just making numbers up here, interest rates go up to 5%, the guy next door can say, hey, I'm going to issue you a bond uh, at 5% uh, for 30 years. You'll say, man, oh man, I want that. So the one that's paying three is worth less. That's why when interest rates go up that your fixed income, your bonds fall in value because those payments are worth less because uh, what they call the risk-free rate, which is the, the government rate, uh, becomes higher and it, and it becomes closer to what the riskier uh, rates are for corporate bonds and some other bonds. So as you can see here in TLT, yeah, you know, we started a year about 149 or so, and we're down to 130. That's a hell of a pullback. That's over 10% downside. 
and it only pays about 3% a year in annual dividends if you hold for a whole year. So that I could see why people are moving out of bonds. And, and, and I think that's a great move. Same thing uh, with cash, because when it comes to cash, uh, inflation hurts that. It hurts the value of, of your dollar. So people are moving out of cash, out of bonds. So where do you go? Equities, stocks, cryptos potentially. Maybe gold, but I think that's most people are in there already. I don't see a lot of money going into gold at this point. I talked about the manager's index uh, or survey uh, last week that showed highest weighting ever in commodities for big money managers. So I don't see that really having much upside there. I keep saying it's equities, folks. It's stocks. You don't want to be in bonds. You don't want to be in cash. Where are you going to go? You got to go somewhere. I mean, you can dig a hole in the backyard, but you're still sitting in cash, right? So I think that there's just there, there's so many uh, tailwinds right now uh, for equities, considering the action that we've seen, considering I think the conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine, we're coming numb to that already. Um, I think inflation eventually is going to come down once supply chains get fixed and, and, and the conflict gets a little bit better. Uh, interest rates are priced in. It's just it, it, there's so many reasons that stocks should be going up here. And, and corporate profits coming in at an all-time high this year. GDP is expected to grow about, what, 6 7% this year. You got a lot, lot, a lot of tailwinds here, folks. Uh, so I thought that was interesting that Goldman Sachs said people are, are doing that. And, and I think that's the right move for a lot of people. There's also what they, they call uh, an inverted yield curve. That means when you're getting a higher interest rate for less time. So what that means is... Again, I'm just going to use numbers, that, saying that they, we're going to give you 5% for a two-year bond and 4% for a 10-year bond. You say to yourself, why would I lock in for that longer amount of time if I can get 5% in two years and roll it back out? It's because we don't know where interest rates are going to go from there. And when the Fed starts raising interest rates, typically the shorter ones tend to move up a little bit higher and quicker. So a recession uh, signal, uh, they call it when the yield cur curve inverts, and a lot of times look at the 10-year versus the two-year treasury. Well, yesterday or a day and a half ago, the five-year briefly was paying more than the 30-year. It's the first time we saw that inversion since 2006. So you have that, and then it went right back to not being inverted. Uh, and then we have the 10-year uh, and a two-year. I'll pull up a chart here for you. So the, the, the spread, the difference is about 0.18%. That, that was of last night when I made this chart up. And um, you can see there's a few times, this is the line where it goes inverted. It inverted back here in uh, 2006, and it's kind of went all, all over the place for a little bit. And as we know, we did hit a recession uh, in 08, 09, when we had the great financial collapse. So that proved to be uh, pretty good there. And then again, 2000, we knew we had a little tech bubble, so it proved to be good there. But we also got close uh, on, on this chart. Uh, not too long ago, 2018, but we didn't didn't break through. And again, you go back here, if you go back further, about 1988 or so, there wasn't really much going on there as far as uh, a big recession happening and hurting the market at that point. But it has been pretty uh, uh, spot on. That being said, we ha it hasn't inverted yet. It's at 0.18%. If it goes negative and you're starting to get the, the two-year yielding more than the 10-year, then we'll see that happen. But again, I think we're in, a, we're in a much different situation here right now. So if it happens, I'll let you know and we'll discuss it at that point. But it's nothing to, to freak out over yet. And because I remember people freaking out as I just showed you in 2018 when it happened and it never ended up or it almost happened, never actually even ended up happening. All right, before I get to a couple stocks, um, I wasn't going to talk about this, but it just irritates me when I see and, and, and anytime I talk about a politician or anything, people get, get pissed off at me and, and I'm about to bash Elizabeth Warren. And she's a Democrat. It doesn't mean I'm bashing Democrats. I'm bashing her as an individual. Um, but I, I, I'd i say, and this is, I hate to be negative. There's probably, it's the old 80-20 rule. I'd say 80% of politicians are completely full of it, are out for themselves, not their constituents, uh, and just aren't the best for our country, both sides of the aisle. Uh, Elizabeth Warren falls into that 80% camp. 20%, I, I think, you know, maybe it's a little high, but let's be optimistic. 20% are actually trying to do good for the world. But the 80%, uh, she's in there. And, and I'll tell you why, because she she speaks things that aren't true. And today I watched her on CBC on the plane. I had it on my phone. And I, I don't know why I watch it, but I, I it's, it's good to get views of, of all different types of people. But what, what really bothered me about this wasn't as much as her views on taxes and on success. Uh, one comment which I found was crazy is she talked, uh, Joe Kernan, the, the, the um, anchor, asked her about Elon Musk paying, uh, I think it was $11 billion in taxes last year, this past year, I can't remember, and why he is not 
celebrated more because he has hired so many people. He's uh, lowered the cost of electric vehicles. Uh, he's ultimately changed the world. He really has. Whether you like him or not, he, he has done a lot of good for the world. And she's like, oh, I do celebrate him. But once you get there, you have to, you have to pay back. Well, let him pay back because that $11 billion in taxes, if that was going places that I thought truly helped our country, I'm, I'm, I'm behind it. But the fact that we hand this over to these crooked politicians and then they decide where that $11 billion goes, how much of that $11 billion do you think actually makes it into people's hands that need it? Very little. Let's follow that path. We wouldn't have to raise taxes so much if we would stop spending like drunken sailors. When I say we, I mean the government. So it, it's, it's, they're always pointing fingers at us, at us. She said the word millionaires and billionaires a few times. I'm clearly not a billionaire, but I am a millionaire. I'm a multimillionaire. But I came from absolutely nothing, one of five kids, and worked my damn ass off 80 hours a week through my 20s and 30s and into my 40s. Work my ass off. And I deserve it. And yes, hire people. You know, I had companies. I sold them recently, but I hired people. I put money back in. I helped people create so much wealth over the years in managing their money. But it's not about all money, folks. It's about if you work hard, you deserve what you get. And sure, you should give some back. Absolutely. But why should a government tell us where that money goes? I always said if I run for office, which I'm never going to do, I'd say you have to pay your taxes. But here are 20 initiatives. You pick. You're pissed off because the road has potholes? We'll put money, money in infrastructure. You could check infrastructure. Wherever, if you want to have better schools, check schools. Better health care, check health care. I think that's such an easy way to do it. Let, let us distribute our, because this is a democracy, right? Let us distribute where our money goes. Anyway, the, the point of why I want to bring this up was, um, she's basically saying capitalism doesn't work. And again, I'm not, I'm not getting that debate today. But what, what made me angry is, is she made it sound like the average person. She kept, you know, these politicians always grab on this, this keyword. She kept saying school teachers. And my brother's a school teacher, so I can say what I want about school teachers. Uh, he makes decent money for being a school teacher. Um, yeah, is it a tough job? Sure. But a lot of tough jobs are tough. But she kept bringing up school teachers saying, well, they didn't have the opportunity. They didn't have the opportunity. My brother had the opportunity to choose to do what he wanted. He went to college on a full scholarship. He was a great athlete. He could have chose to do whatever path. He chose to be a coach and teach phys ed in a high school. And he's happy as can be. But it doesn't mean he doesn't invest in the stock market. And that's what really get, irritates me. She makes it sound as if that school teacher doesn't have the opportunity to invest in a stock market. He does. I help manage his money. He puts away, he maxes out his 403B. He's always looking for uh, opportunities. He asks me about cryptos. We, we get him invested because he saves money, lives a good life, and then puts it back in. So when politicians come out and say that the average people people are getting fleeced, I was below average wealth-wise coming up. Education-wise, I went to small little crappy schools, if you will. Not crappy, but they weren't Ivy League schools or anything of that sort. But if you work hard and invest your money, folks, you can all do it. My point is, anybody out there saying, well, I only have $2,000 right now. I only have $500. You got to start somewhere. And if your job offers you a 401k, max it out. Do whatever you can. Don't put so much in it that you can't buy groceries. But I'll tell you what, you cut out one meal here, one meal there, whatever you're, you're spending your money on that is discretionary that you don't really need, you'd be amazed in five or 10 years, you look at your 401k and you're sitting on six figures. I've seen it happen all the time. So there is an opportunity here for everybody. This country is still the greatest country. It gives us opportunities. Still, why do you think people still want to knock down the doors and come here? So I hope the politicians don't F that up because I think they're on a pretty damn good path to do it. Um, but let's hope they don't. And let's vote in people who actually believe in us to be smart, to make our own decisions because we can invest in a stock market. We can become wealthy. We can enjoy the fruits of a rising stock market. Don't let the politicians tell us we can't because we can. All right. Sorry, I had to go on that rant, maybe because I woke up at 4 a.m., but either way, it, it needed to be said. And again, it wasn't as much a political rant, folks. It was a rant about that we can all do this regarding, regardless of how much money you have right now. We can all put money in the market and we can all watch it grow. We can all invest in good companies and we can all take advantage of the great innovations that are going to be taking place in the roaring 2020s and make money off them. 
We have the opportunity to do that, which is fantastic. So we should feel blessed we have that opportunity and be grateful for it, not put it down. So let's talk about three ideas that I think you should add to your watch list. Again, nothing is a buy or sell recommendation, but I think you should be adding this to your watch list. And so what I looked at is, I guess it's kind of funny now, but I looked at um, brands and, and, and consumer facing uh, goods uh, and one's a service industry that will do well even in inflationary times and, and in higher interest rates um, because the wealthier people don't care if milk costs an extra 30 cents. Honestly, they don't. And it doesn't matter to them. It's not going to change their life because they're not living paycheck to paycheck. So I looked at uh, areas that I thought and brands that I thought would be uh, good. And, and I think that would that would hold up regardless um, of where, where the market's at and regardless of where inflation is at. So the first one we're going to take a look at here, uh, this is Park Hotels and Resorts, resorts symbol PK. It's having a nice day today at 4.3%, breaking out, breaking out here on the right-hand side. So this is a $4.5 billion REIT. Uh, and, and a REIT is R-E-I-T, and REIT is a real estate investment trust. And they own 54 different premium hotels, uh, 32,000 rooms total. 86% of those rooms, they fall into the luxury and upper upscale segments. Some of the, their portfolio includes a New York Hilton, Midtown. You've probably seen that if you've ever been to Times Square. Uh, the W in Chicago, two W's in Chicago. Uh, the JW Marriott in San Francisco. If you've ever been there, you've probably seen that as well. Um, doesn't pay a dividend like, like most uh, REITs do, but uh, this is more of a play on travels picking up. People, luxury travel is definitely picking up. I, I'm on a plane a lot recently, and I'll be on a plane a lot more coming up in the next couple of months, and I see it. I see prices going up. That means demand's going up. Um, so yeah, I think this is a nice way to, to, to play this. Their revenue the next three years is expected to increase by about 29% annually. Their earnings by about 126% annually. Uh, they, they fell out of profitability because of obviously the pandemic, but expected to go back to being profitable in 2023. So next year to the tune of 93 cents a share. Uh, so that's pretty impressive, go, you know, getting right back up to where it was, uh, uh, very higher than it even was before the pandemic. Uh, but again, this is a nice way to play um, inflation going up, but not getting hurt because most people that are going to these hotels aren't as worried about inflation. Again, paying a little bit more at the at the grocery store or to put uh, uh, gas in the tank. It's also a play on continued um, reopening of people traveling more and getting out. Also more business travel. I'm going to a ton of conferences in the next couple of months. So that wasn't happening a year ago or even two years ago. For the last two years, I really haven't gone to many conferences. We're suddenly having that come back. And a lot of, obviously, if you're a business uh, uh, traveler, you tend to stay at nicer hotels. You have conferences at these hotels. So I, I think this is one you definitely want to put on your watch list here, folks. The next one is uh, MCFT, is a symbol, uh, Mastercraft Boat Holdings. It's a $455 million company. And I'll pull up the chart here for you. And it's, it's a pretty similar looking chart that we just saw. It's having a nice day today, too, up 4%. Jeez, should have bought all these yesterday, huh? Again, I have no exposure to these, no, no, uh, no nothing in my portfolio of, of these uh, stocks. But as I mentioned, four hundred fifty-five million. It's 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 a boat maker, and it's got a, a bunch of different brands. Uh, the big ones are obviously the the namesake Mastercraft, uh, Nautic Star, Crest. Their revenues are expected to be about ten percent uh, next couple of years. Bottom line earnings twenty-two percent annually, and there was a dip in sales in, in fiscal year twenty twenty because obviously with the pandemic, it just there was a dip in sales. It fell down to three hundred sixty-three million. This fiscal year that we're in right now, uh, looking for 655 million. Next year, nearly 720 million. So a, a real big turnaround, nearly doubling uh, in, in about uh, four years off that low. Earnings per share uh, last fiscal year came in at 331, uh, looking for 428 this year, then 493 next year. So again, you're looking at uh, some pretty impressive numbers. And if you look at uh, just this year, uh, you can see the share price right here is 2620, folks. And you take a look at the Earnings per share estimates 428. So you're trading at a PE ratio in the mid single digits. I mean, that's extremely cheap for something that's growing, that's bouncing back. And again, a boat is something where if you're going to buy a boat, you're not as concerned about, well, it's going to cost me a lot to put gas in the boat. Either you want a boat or you don't want a boat. Uh, and, not, and you don't necessarily have to be wealthy to own a boat, but boats are not cheap, you know, for the most part. So, and, and, uh, 
I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale all week and playing golf with a bunch of high school buddies. And one guy was looking at boats and he said, it's, it's like impossible to get. And he looked at a similar boat two years ago at a boat show. And now this year, and how much more it costs this year, just because supply and demand. I mean, there, there is definitely a, a, a demand uh, surge. The only thing that could hurt a company like Mastercraft Boat is they can't keep up with the demand. They, they don't supply. So supply chain issues could hurt them. But I think the demand stays for quite some time as more people move out of cities, more people moving to rural areas, more people moving closer to water. Uh, so uh, I, I like Mastercraft down here. And the last one is uh, really kind of ultra wealthy, if you will. Uh, it's Ferrari and the symbols race, R-A-C-E. And you can see a chart here. It, it was at a high in November. Then it sold off with a lot of other uh, growth stocks and uh, auto stocks. And it, I mean, eventually Ferrari is going to be an EV play as well, electric vehicle. But, you know, very expensive, exotic cars. Uh, it's known for its uh, ties to Formula One, which I talked about that stock just last week. Uh, so you got to kind of play on that, which I like. Uh, it did have a dip in 2020, like everything else. Uh, but back to record sales, uh, 2021, this past year, $5 billion, looking for $6.4 billion by 2024. Uh, last year made $5.07 a share, and next year looking for six thirteen. so nice little pump up on that. And I, I, I tell you, you know, being in uh, Fort Lauderdale, I was in West Palm Beach a few, about a month or so ago, or Palm Beach, I said, no, West Palm, Palm Beach. Uh, and uh, I live in the area now too down there. It's amazing how many Ferraris and these high-end cars that you see. The amount of money is floating around in Miami. I know it's always been like that, but I, I've never been a car guy, so I never really put two and two together. Uh, but again, if you're looking to buy a Ferrari or anything comparable to that, you're not too worried about inflation right now. It's just not, it's not affecting you. So the, 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 the brands I just mentioned, the Park Hotels and Resorts, uh, the Mastercraft Boat, they... Uh, they're brands that aren't affected by inflation going higher. And of course, Ferrari. Uh, another another side note here, the Ferrari family, the family that started Ferrari, uh, they are a, a shareholder. They own 13% of a company called Ferretti. They're about to go IPO in Hong Kong. And it's a luxury yacht builder. Um, and, and they actually just went public through a raise in Hong Kong. They raised about $242 million. At the lower end of the range, though. But because things in Hong Kong right now, the market's coming back, but still. Uh, they have six shipyards in Italy, and a majority um, uh, shareholder, largest shareholder, is a Chinese firm. So that's why you see it going public in Hong Kong. But uh, that's I thought that was pretty fascinating because you talk about luxury again. Luxury cars, one thing. Luxury hotels, one thing. Luxury kind of boats, are one thing. But luxury yachts, that's a whole another whole another level. And they just had a big boat show in Palm Beach uh, this past week in West Palm. And I saw some of the reporting from there. I mean, it's just bananas how big these are, how much they cost. Uh, but so, the, so those are three stocks, I think, if, if you're concerned about inflation. And not just inflation hedges, but also stocks that I think are good companies and, and they have good upside potential going along with it. So I want to share that with you. And let's go back real quick. We'll take a look at the market before we wrap up the show. We got the S&P up about six tenths of a percent off the lows of the day now. If we close here, it's the best close we've had since mid-January, folks. Uh, and, and remember, if you take a look at where we are right now, we're down about phew, less than 5% from an all-time high. S&P 500 is less than 5% below an all-time high. I mean, just say that over and over. And then you're going to say, man, why did I freak out? I knew it was going to come back. Well, that's why I'm here twice a week and hopefully more coming up soon to help you in these times when the market does pull back. When a market goes up for the last two and a half weeks straight up, things are easy. You can walk away, go play golf, go do what you do, go to work, go to kick a kids, get a kid's game. But when it's not, it's in your head and it screws with your life and it screws with your, your, your psyche. So I want to be there for you when we have those times to not only say, don't panic, but let's take advantage of this because nobody else is doing it. We can do it. This is where wealthy become wealthier or the middle class moves into the upper class. And it's about money. And if, 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 if you're watching a your show, you're into the stock market and you want to make money. But again, there's three things that we want to do. One is educate you, which I think we did today in a couple of different ways. Two is have fun, which I think we did. And three, make money. We put those three together. We are living one hell of a life, folks. So we're going to continue to do that. And we'll be back Thursday with a pretty cool show, the quarterly wrap up and then look ahead to the second quarter uh, at the same time. But I want to thank everybody, everybody for watching out there. I hope you have a good next couple of days. Uh, we'll be in a studio here again Thursday in Baltimore coming to you uh, live from the Charm City. But again, thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money.
Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.